Um, I'm now an automaton. Once it was straightforward. We were born free and shackled <laughs> by self-serving authority. Now many, from neuroscientists to social theorists, argue we were never free in the first place. I'm not. Constrained by our genes, manipulated by technology, there seems to be little space left for individual autonomy. Should we conclude that the very idea of freedom was a mistake which, once abandoned, will enable us to reframe human behaviour and success and create a more equal society? Or is this madness that threatens not just our personal lives, but the values of responsibility and opportunity on which our culture was built? Which is a big question. Oscar, Oscar. Uh, and that's as much as you usefully hear from me to, uh, today. However, we do have uh, a terrific uh, panel to discuss these uh, issues, which are pretty important and pretty central. Uh, on my far right is Paul Brocks. Uh, Paul Brock is a clinical neuropsychologist turned freelance writer. Um, his latest book, The Darker the Night, The Brighter the Stars, covers topics like fate, grief and humanity from a neuropsychological yet highly personal perspective. Um, on my immediate right is Hannah Dawson, history, historian of ideas, political philosopher and author. She's written extensively on early moral philosophy, power structures and the normativity of nature. No, I have no idea either. Um, on my immediate left is Julian Bergini. Julian is academic director of the Royal Institute of Philosophy and founder of the Philosopher's Magazine. His book, How the World Thinks, was described by the Observer as there to fill the sapiens size hole in your life. Uh, and on my far left is Hilary Lawson. Uh, without him, we just wouldn't be here. He's also a post postmodern philosopher and critic of philosophical realism who is best known for his theory of closure. The question which each of my speakers is going to have three minutes to uh, think about and talk about with you are, do genes, technology and society now leave no space for individual freedom? Um, and it's you first, Paul. OK. Um, well, I come at this perspective of, of neuroscience, neuropsychology, um, clinical neuropsychology in particular, um, and in case I drop dead of a heart attack in the next 10 minutes, I want to give you my take in just a couple of lines. Do we have free will? Yes and no. Um, and I'm comfortable with that paradox, or that uh, um, contradiction. And the point I really want to get across is I think free will is intimately intertwined with the notion of the self. We can't understand free will doesn't have any meaning at levels of analysis below talk of the self or the person. Why is it important? Why is free will important? Um, because really, because every kind of freedom, political, economic, social, personal, whatever, rests on this very basic assumption that we have free will, that we can take decisions, we can choose the course of our lives, we take trivial decisions every minute of the day, we take big decisions not quite so often, but we're taking decisions all the time and that is the essence of being a person, I think. So it, free will is fundamental to the sense of self. So I, need, we th I think we need to put the question of free will squarely within that context. I think free will doesn't make any sense at lower levels of analysis, like uh, biology, neurophysiology, uh, certainly not physics. Um, at that level, words like purpose and goals and aims and decisions and choices, choices don't have any currency whatsoever. However, they're the coin of the realm at the level at which we talk about ordinary things, people interacting with each other, the goals and plans that we have in our daily lives. Now, I arrived at this point of view partly through my work in clinical neuropsychology. And when I got into this field about 30 years ago, um, we knew quite a bit about how the brain does things like memory and language and controls action and so forth. We did not know very much about how all that came together to produce a sense of self, an introspective sense of self. And it dawned on me that we could actually begin to think about these things in a neurological sort of way. And I also realized that there were people who had certain brain conditions who completely lost their sense of free will and therefore their sense of personhood. And I won't elaborate on that now, but we can come back to that if, if it's helpful in this time. Um, 
Free, free will or the sense of free will contributes to that part of ourselves which gives us unity. There's another part which gives us continuity over time. But it's that sort of unity, that point of consciousness, the decision-taking entity. So I'm prepared to accept hard determinism. Um, it's neither here nor there to me. I'm prepared to accept a materialist view of the brain. Every thought, feeling, and action depends on brain systems, brain function. And I'm also prepared, and we'll get onto this later maybe, to accept that neuroscience has some very strong challenges to the idea of free will. Um, but it's only at the level of conscious self that it really means anything at all. So um, I think I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Paul. Hannah. Thank you. Um, so I think I, I think I kind of agree with a lot of what you've said, Paul. I mean, it seems to me that the question um, are human beings free or not is the wrong question um, and a dangerous question because if we ask ourselves about the ways in which human beings, all human beings, are caught in a deterministic universe inevitably, that focuses our attention away from the really crucial ways in which some human beings are more free than others. So philosophers have long thought that just as a matter of metaphysical reality, we live in a deterministic universe. Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century, David Hume in the 18th century, thought that every action that human beings perform comes about as a result of a chain of cause and effect. That's just the world, that's the metaphysical reality about the world that we live in. When I am confronted with a choice between a stick of celery and a piece of chocolate, however much I think I might have wanted to choose the celery, in the, in the end I choose the chocolate. Um, you know, I think as I'm going out for an evening that I'm not going to drink. And then I get someone hands me a glass of wine, I think, all right. And there's this way in which my actions are determined. Um, you know, another sort of deeper kind of psychoanalytic way of thinking about it would be that um, I used to think a lot about freedom and the way in which I was making choices. But it just turns out, as a matter of fact, that I've ended up doing broadly the same job as my mother. So there's a kind of, so, so there's this deterministic uh, metaphysical reality. But what David Hume pointed out is that, sure, the world is, the universe is governed by determinism. But that has no bearing on our phenomenological experience of the world, which is that of freedom. We feel as though we are free. We, we, um, we experience freedom. And it's that lived reality, which I think we need to concentrate on, partly because, as Paul has suggested, um, without the belief in freedom, we lose all sense of responsibility. So if it's, if it's um, not the case that I'm free not to murder, if I'm not free not to lie, then it would make no sense to blame me for doing those things. And the entirety of society becomes unintelligible unless we take it for granted that there is such a thing as freedom and the responsibility that goes alongside that. And secondly, the reason why I think we have to think about the freedom as it is experienced is because we all know the difference between um, a life that feels free and a life that is impeded in various ways. We are sitting here in Hampstead free to talk about freedom when there are people in this country who are locked in rooms being forced to have sex. There is a, there is a very distinct, um, there are many crucial distinctions uh, between the experience of freedom and different people's lives. And it's that, um, that sharp end, if you like, of the lived experience of freedom or unfreedom that we need to uh, take account of. A woman is unfree if she does not have access to legal, safe, free abortion. And of course, there, the ambiguity of the word free is very instructive because it indicates the ways in which our freedom as human beings is deeply dependent on our economic circumstances. So there are very basic ways in which money gives you freedom. In some countries, if you don't actually have money, you don't have the freedom to live because you can't afford health care. So I think that we have to take account, we don't, we don't wait you know, screw the metaphysics. <laughs> and, um, and let's focus on our lived reality, which is that we know the difference between a free and a less free life. And it's our responsibility 
as free agents to try to give people as much control over their lives as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Screw the metaphysics t-shirts will be available <laughs> after this session. <laughs> Julian Bagini. I think when, when Hannah said that free or not in that binary choice is the wrong question, I, I, that's what I, I completely agree with. I think that if, we, if there's any capacity that human beings have which deserves the name of free will, it's not something we either have or don't have. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.